Welcome to The Subverse. I am your host, Susan Matthews. This is a podcast where we journey from the cosmic to the quantum, from the songs of whales and trees to the secret world of microspecies and microbes, from colonial histories that haunt us to reimagining futures. This episode is a very special one for me, an author whom I only recently discovered while researching all things water. I am so honored to have as my guest Alexis Pauline Gums from Durham, North Carolina, a queer black feminist writer, poet, activist, and educator. Alexis has written a number of wonderful books on revolutionary mothering, a poetic triptych of Spill, M. Archive, and Dub, and her recent book, Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals, published in 2020. This was the subject of our conversation. Given our own explorations on water this year, I found so much salience with Alexis's work and thoughts. In M Archive, she talks about how water is not separate from us and that in our species rush to dominate other species, we had forgotten the meaning of water and us mostly water people, ungrateful for their births, had found themselves finally in the dust. Her latest book, Undrowned, is a different kind of guidebook for our species based on the subversive and transformative guidance of marine mammals. Through interspecies ancestral learning and her daily practice of writing, she's created such a remarkable book, one which has given me strength in some dark moments in the last few months. In this book, we are constantly surprised and learn from whales, dolphins, seals, and other mammals on how to survive, how to care, and how to love. Do yourself and others a favor by reading this book and passing on its wisdom. And ask yourself a question she raises in the book. What indentation am I making on the surface of this earth, even if it is so far underwater, no one can see? Alexis, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Subverse. Thank you so much for welcoming me here into the Subverse. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Alexis, when I first reached out to you, it was to talk about your book, Undrowned, which for me personally has been a refuge for the last many months. However, when I started preparing, I did go back to your earlier trilogy of Spill, M Archive and Dub, as I do feel that all these books are part of a poetic continuum. But maybe we can start with our conversation with speaking about this poetic continuum, all these books that you have written, and the ancestral listening that has rendered these books. Yeah, thank you for that. So all of these books really come out of, they really are artifacts of my daily practice. So the way that I wrote each of them is the same, right? The books themselves, the content of them, some things about them are very different from each other. But in each case with Spill and M Archive and Dub and Undrowned, I woke up and I wrote first thing in the morning and I did the same thing. So in Undrowned, it was like, open my guidebooks about marine mammals and write about one marine mammal or with Spill, it was open my written down quotes of Hortense Spillers. And right from that, with M Archive, it was the same thing, but with questions from M. Jackie Alexander's work. And with Dub, it was from Sylvia Winter's work. So in a way, it's like, I'm doing the same thing. And yet it takes me to completely different places in some sense. But I also think that you're right, that there is a continuum where spill, I felt like I was getting to all of these scenes of Black women seeking freedom. And that's where I ended up arriving each day and describing those scenes. And with M Archive, it was like projected into a future where archivists would be looking back at the remains of what we had done <laughs> with life and as a world. And that ultimately took me to a, a multi-species place, you know, that there was actually different species looking back on what was so-called humanity. And in Dub, I saw it as a, an ancestral listening project, as you say, and I realized what ancestry meant was expanding for me 
while I wrote that, right? Because I was thinking, oh yeah, my Afro-Caribbean ancestors, my Arawak ancestors, you know, all my Irish ancestors, all these different ancestors that I'm listening for. And then I realized it was like the whales, the coral, the kelp, you know, like everybody was like the bacteria, like we have things to say and we are related to you. And that is, that's such a profound truth. And without that journey, I don't think I would get to the place in Undrowned where I'm writing as a marine mammal apprentice. I'm using an approach that really refuses separation between any aspect of life on this planet. And I know for a fact that like back when I started writing Spill, I would never would have written Undrowned or Dub or M Archive. So the continuum is really just my expanding consciousness that, that folks get to witness with these artifacts of me just waking up every morning and being like, here is where I can go with the guides that I have, right? Which are these incredible Black feminist theorists or incredible marine mammals that are leading me to places that I need to be, but that I would not have been able to describe. Thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating, Alexis. And I also love the way you talk about that morning practice being the constant. And, you know, this year in our season of the subverse, we are focused on water. And water plays this overwhelmingly huge role in all your books. And I'd love to know more about the role that water plays in your own life and how it inspires you and holds you in this process of writing. Oh yeah, I mean water water is everything. I think water is for me one of the most tangible reminders of how interconnected life is, right? Like we need water. I'm here with my water bottle. It has a sticker on it from the Salish Sea Collective who I just got to meet last week in Seattle and it's necessary, right? Like we actually have to hydrate every cell of our bodies, every microorganism that makes up what we call our bodies needs water. And water is not separate, right? The oceans and the bodies of water are not separate from each other. The cycle of rain and evaporation and precipitation is not separate, right? All of these things are not simply metaphors for how connected life is. They are obvious evidence (laughs) of how life is, and we have to participate in that, right? Water is like air, and of course, not separate from air because we have water vapor within us, is reminding us of this constant circulation, this constant flow, and this interdependence and interconnectivity of all of life. So I'm so excited that you all are focusing on that. There's so many places to go, but I think that what the ocean in particular has allowed me to experience in my writing process has been really holding a space for a depth of emotion that is honestly terrifying to me. Just like, it's kind of terrifying to be in the ocean. Like, you don't know, like anything could be in here. Like we don't know a hungry shark could roll up at any second. Like it's all possible. And that's true with our emotional realities too. We don't know what's going to happen, where we're going to go. It's so big and expansive and connected to everything that it can be overwhelming. But understanding that Marine mammals are actually physically in that reality of that huge connectedness and breathing through that all the time is like, okay, well, I can do that too in relationship to this vast ocean that is my emotional life that I have barely, barely, barely entered the surface of. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Alexis. And now we can actually speak about Undrowned, which, as I mentioned, has been a real refuge for me. The last couple of months, I've really struggled with purpose and meaning. And this book really sort of arrived as a gift, a cosmic gift. And in this book, you have 19 movements, thematic movements. And you call this also a guide to undrowning. 
So I'd love to hear more about the title itself because it is so intriguing and also how you distinguish between the drowned and the undrowned and also how collective breathing at a scale is the foundation of this book. Yeah, collective breathing is definitely the foundation of this book. And I guess speaking also to that continuum, I don't think I necessarily would have been able to write a book that has collective breathing at its foundation without this practice of Black feminist breathing that I've been in for the past several years as a form of meditation and as a form of chanting the insights of the Black feminists who've influenced my own practice of Black feminism. So yeah, and also when I was writing this, I didn't know that when it came out, we would be in the midst of a pandemic that very specifically threatens our breathing and that is transmitted through our collective breathing. So that is something I could not have predicted, but is in fact some of the context. So Undrowned, to me, is this way of thinking about this process of breathing in unbreathable circumstances, right? So on a very basic level, what brings me so much awe and what moves me about witnessing the reality of marine mammals is that it doesn't seem to make any sense. Like it doesn't seem to be possible that really a mammal with lungs, like how I have lungs, could live in the ocean and just dive so deep underwater and live in the water all the time. In some cases, of course, there's some marine mammals that don't live in the water hundred percent of the time and yet breathe. And then when I think about us, I think about myself, I think about the context that we're living in with all its intersecting oppressions. It's like, oh yeah, we are breathing in unbreathable circumstances, obviously brought into light so horrifically by some of the instances of police violence where people have been literally begging for breath. And I think about that. And for me, this impossible breathing that yet happens is connected to me to the middle passage of kidnapped, enslaved Africans and the whaling industry itself, which are coterminous and maybe shouldn't even be thought of as separate. And understanding and really just feeling the knowledge in my body that those ancestors who survived the Middle Passage and those ancestors who refused to survive the Middle Passage were also in relationship with the marine mammals who were hunted along those same routes, sometimes by those same ships, and that there is a breathing through something like that that seems like it would be impossible to breathe through that creates a context. And it it very much has created the context that we live in. You could think about that economically, that what the transatlantic slave trade was, is the economic foundation of our current global economies. You could think about the fact that the hunting and killing and processing of the blubber of whales and other marine mammals is literally, was the oil, was the light, was the energy source that also fueled this entire uh, society that we still are participating in, right? Of course, now we got other terrible violence that we're doing around other sources of oil, you know, and that is, I like the word that you use, continuum, that is along the same continuum. But I think about undrowning as what we are faced with, right? We're faced with a context that is drowning in its weight, in its heaviness, in its danger, in its threat to our breath really. And we are related through our ancestry, our interconnection, our kinship with marine mammals to the possibility of yet still breathing. 
It's beautiful. Thank you so much, Alexis. And very sobering, especially when you spoke about the transatlantic slavery, the Middle Passage, the absolute horror and terror of it. When I was reading your book, I was really reminded of these really horrible histories, which we still live with. And in the thematic movements in the book, I really wish we could discuss them all because each one of them is so special. And yet they're also interconnected. It's like music. It's like you've also got to see some parts together. But I would really like to hear more about actually the last chapter, which is the 19th one, where the last line is about giving thanks. And this particular chapter talks about taking care of your blessings. And it's sort of linked already with what you've said, which is that in impossible circumstances, we still continue to breathe and we continue to live. And here you talk about specific mammals and the precarious situations they find themselves in and how they continue to survive. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about this particular movement. Oh, sure. I mean, take care of your blessings is something that the great Black feminist writer, cultural worker, educator, Tony K. Bambara used to sign her letters with. She would be like writing to her friends, writing to her colleagues, and then she'd say, take care of your blessings, which were her own initials, TCB, Tony K. Bambara. And when I think about the marine mammal meditations that are in that section, they touch on these ideas of mothering and of care and of interconnectedness beyond individuality, even within species or also across species. And this idea of care is so crucial to life. If I'm asking the question, how can we breathe through unbreathable circumstances? It's like we need each other in order to be able to do that, right? That's why it is a foundation of collective breath. And so this idea, take care of your blessings, I'm implying that we are each other's blessings. And I'm also seeking to honor and highlight so we can learn from it. How do these marine mammals protect each other? What does it mean to look and be like, okay, seals that are not the parents of these other seals, they protect the mothers so the parenting can happen, right? And how are we protecting or not protecting the mothers, right? In our society, in every way that that means, or what does it mean that different species of dolphin We'll just adopt each other and care for each other. And that is something that is common. Like, how do we remember that and try to unlearn this idea that, oh, our species is separate from all other species or my family is separate from all other families. And it's not to my benefit to love, protect and care for anyone else you know, who's, who's here. And, or even like the, the sea otters and their protectiveness and how, at least at the time that I wrote this, nobody had been able to measure like how big are their babies when they're born because they're like, you will not, you know, all of those actions, I think we could take as inspiration or also reminders of the fierceness with which we have to love each other in order to be real about what our context is, what our circumstances are, and also to really, really push back against this lie that is the necessary lie for the separation, for neoliberalism, for all the forms of oppression to function that say like, we're separate. I can take care of myself, right? But it's like, take care of your blessings. What are those? And I wanted to end with that because I think the most important thing is how deeply we need each other across species, across all these different forms of difference that may be part of our stories of understanding life. And ultimately to end with that gratitude of knowing that if there's just one witness, I know for sure <laughs> that I would not be here without the blessings of so many and yeah, there's a gratitude that I feel for all of the mothers, the chosen mothers, the parents, the comrades, the co-conspirators, everybody who has taken loving action that has made my life possible and better and breathable. And then there's also the deep honor that it is to be able 
to be blessed by caring for you. That is such a source of gratitude. It brings out an aspect of what it is to be alive that is so crucial. And so I just decided to close with really celebrating that because I think that that's, it's one of those things, like if you're left with one thing, <laughs> you know, hold on to that. That's that's absolutely fantastic. In fact, I really liked that chapter so much because so many kind of wellness books and other books sort of tell you to kind of make a list, 10 things that you should be thankful for and so many gratitude practices. And I often find sometimes that I do it and I don't really feel it. It's like a parody of gratitude rather than real gratitude or like a performance of happiness. When I read your chapter, I, I started looking at it a little bit differently. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I know that that's an honor. And I do want this to be something that we feel, you know, even more than we understand it, you know, something that we can feel. I think intrinsically, it is a lesson that we know. I think it's just the one that we just keep forgetting. Yeah, yeah. We'll be back after a break. So apart from this particular movement, two others which I would love to discuss with you. One is when you talk about practice and dorsal fins and dorsal practices. It's a particularly uh, lovely section. And I love one particular line in that especially, where you say that, I like to think that we're all living in the long water prayer of the blue whales, that meditative sound that travels hundreds of miles underwater. Such a stunning line. Mm -hmm. I know, right? And speaking of feeling it, it's like, oh, this vibrational field that the blue whales are creating is so expansive. And... As you say, I think that we know how interconnected we are as life on this planet. I think in a deep way, we know that. And then we keep forgetting. And just to remember that like, we are still living in the sound of some blue whales, you know, like right now it's reaching us. It can't not reach us. It's just that big, right? And that continuing to remember is behind this concept of dorsal practice, right? And practice, obviously practice is very important to me. This whole thing is practice, right? I wrote every single day about the marine mammals as a practice. And so the power of repetition and what we do over and over again, we can see that everywhere, right? I mean, capitalism functions by forced repetition, right? You show up for work every day and therefore <laughs> that institution continues to exist, right? That's how repetition works. And what if we want something different to exist? Well, we have to repeat and repeat and repeat, right? And make those spaces. But yes, so one of the things that I think is so incredible about some marine mammals and some fish, you know, that have dorsal fins is how amazing to be able to have this physical part of your body that gives you stability in this context that is by definition, unstable, right? It's water, it's the ocean, it is not a stable surface and it never will be. And yet the dorsal fin allows you to have enough stability that you can navigate, right? And that you can move with the kind of grace that dolphins move with and orca move with. And it's so relevant to our lives where we are in very unstable context, right? There may be some pretense of stability. It's not stable, you know, like, and maybe it shouldn't be, right? Things are changing all the time and change is part of how life works. And how then do we move with any intentionality when we're in a context that's always shifting? And I believe that that's through practice. That movement and fluidity is so important to who I am and how I live, and yet what anchors me, what grounds me, right? And it's practice. It's the practice. It's the practice of having this tea. It's the practice of writing every morning. It's the physical practices. It's my meditation practices. It's my communication practices. It's my practice of reaching out and speaking to my little nieces every day. All of those things allow me to have intention, 
right? Allow me to actually be moving in my life with intention as opposed to like, well, what was Alexis's life? She just was kind of tossed here and there by the wind and the water. She ended up somewhere, you know, that's not, (laughs) that's not what I want. What I want is to be able to be honest about the fact that we are in a state of constant flux and yet still be able to move with intention as community with love. This is what it means to take care of our blessings, right? And so I imagine that it would be so cool to have a physical version of that. But what actually makes the indentation into my days are these dorsal practices that stabilize me in meaningful ways. And of course, sometimes those practices change based on what I need in my life, but we all could find that for ourselves. What could be the practices that do that for us? And they might be different for everyone, but I do think that we all need something to hold us through change. Absolutely beautiful and so inspiring. Thank you so much, Alexis. I do agree. And I love that line where you talk about capitalism and forced repetition. It's so true. It's amazing how it's so ingrained. It's automatic. You know, we're always on kind of autopilot. We don't even realize that's the life that we're living unless we disrupt it. Exactly. I mean, and that's one of the things, I mean, with the pandemic and with the initial shutdowns that happened around the pandemic, this is what you see, right? Like, oh, Capitalism doesn't just exist. We have to create it every day. And if we don't, there's this huge threat to it, right? And which has led to, you know, some of this ridiculousness of pretending that COVID is not what it is in order to force people to reproduce capitalism. And it's interesting to see in people's lives, right? Just what that small stop. And now suddenly it's like, there's labor shortages everywhere. Nobody wants to go back to work, (laughs) all of these different things, because as you said, with even a temporary disruption, it's like, oh, this is what I've been repeating, but what if this is not what I want to repeat? There's other things I could repeat. You know, these people, they make it sourdough starters or whatever they started to do. And that, that became their new practices, right? People took on new practices to hold them in the gap and realize that's actually the direction they want to go. Fantastic. I love it. New dorsal practices post-pandemic. So two other movements I'd like to talk about. One is number 10, which is honor your boundaries. And another one, which for me sort of connects very well with this one is 13, refuse. Really powerful sections. And especially in refuse, you ask, what becomes possible when we are immersed in the queerness of forms of life that dominant systems cannot chart, reward, or even understand? If you could speak a little bit more about these two movements. Yeah, I think that there's something, there's something so fascinating to me, right? Of course, I'm writing about marine mammals. I'm interested in marine mammals. And so I get to learn about marine mammals because, you know, scientists have gone and like looked at them and studied them. And um, in some cases in ways that are ethical in some cases in ways that are not ethical. And I always felt so much joy when I would be researching marine mammals and find that they had evaded observation. You know, they had largely evaded observation. So many of these fin whales, they're like, we have actually never seen one. <laughs> like we have never seen what they do when they're alive. We only one has washed up on the shore. That's the only time that we have known that. And I'm like, oh, good for you. <laughs> you know, like that's so amazing. And, and why did I feel so much joy for that? Of course, because I understand that some of the discovery and utilization of animals has led to their extinction for example, which I also write about in Undrowned, but also because I want that. There's a way that I want that. I want to be unknown. I want my unknowability to be something that could be celebrated. And it had me realize, okay, but again, in capitalism, I have to be known Because I have to, it has to be known what can be exploited about me to be useful in capitalism, right? And so that 
is uh, deep. And then it becomes even deeper when it's like, oh, and then to be defined by the ways that I'm exploited ends up being like a self-definition I take on or defining who I'm in community with or, you know, all of these different things. It's like, okay, what would it be like to be free from that? What if these marine mammals who are like, you know, these walruses who are like, I'm just going to pop the research boat with my tusks right now. Um, Y'all going to have to manage that while I swim away. What is that? What's my version of that? How can I refuse what capitalism is demanding of me, which is to sell pieces of myself, right? Constantly. What if there are aspects of myself that I want to protect and that no one will ever know? What if we learn to really just, I mean, maybe this is already how we feel, like cherish the unknown of each other. You know, I think even of like, my partner who I live with and I know very well, we've been together for 14 years. And actually the reason that it's so exciting to arrange my whole life to witness them is because I don't know, you know, like I don't know what they're going to say in this particular circumstance. There's just like an asymptote, you know, like I can't ever fully know what it is to be them. And so that's so interesting, you know, it's like endlessly fascinating. It's endlessly exciting. It's the opposite of what it would mean to be like, yeah, you know, I know this person, I could just predict anything about them. And what makes, what valuing each other's unknowability does is it really allows us to conspire with each other on our growth and change, right? That's what I think about, like, this is my partner, my family members, people who I've known for a really long time, that I don't know who they're going to be in two months from now, or I don't know what they're going to do. Like that means that I'm like, yeah, grow, change, (laughs) you know, find out new things about yourself or try other things that, you know, haven't been the, the slot that you were supposed to be made for that capitalism is using you for. Like, what if it's just a mystery who anyone is? That's so exciting. And I think that it is right. Cause we know everybody does inevitably grow and change, but we have structural forms that are resistant to that, that are like, no, don't change. That will disrupt everything. And it's like, change is so natural (laughs) and change is also inevitably happening. And what if we celebrated that? So there's a train (laughs) that's that's passing by. But I absolutely love this. And it's also made me think my previous career as a lawyer And when you know everything, you can govern it. So much is connected with governance. And we're always scared of those people and places that you cannot govern, that are outside, they're on the edge, or they're ungovernable in some way or the other. And I'm also thinking about technology because you also talk about surveillance is everywhere. Yeah, it's in the oceans and it's it's everywhere. And you don't specifically talk about technology in the book, but I can see so much of what you're saying applying to everything that we're going through in those realms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's so many different technologies, right? And there are digital technologies and there are analog technologies and tea is a technology (laughs) and swimming away is a technology, right? Like anything that can be used for a particular purpose as a technology, right? And It's really, for me, incredible to observe what marine mammals do, what they use, what behaviors they use, what forms they use, like being in the form of a school or of a pod or of a swarm that they use in order to do what? to protect each other, to be able to adapt, to be able to grow, to adapt to a changing climate. All of these things are technologies. And I mean, you speak to surveillance and also thinking about echolocation as a technology and our digital interconnectedness as something that is similar to and different from that. You know, how do we get feedback? How do we operate on 
what Sylvia Winter calls a species scale. And there's something about the technological capacity to connect across huge amounts of space that is exciting for us. And then of course, I'll remind us that whales have been doing this for a long time. Blue whales have been communicating across huge distances of space. And we don't even know all the ways that different forms of life are interconnected and communicating with each other and perceiving each other. I feel like there's so much that we need to remember around that. And in some ways, I think that the technologies that we have access to come out of our desire for that, or at least the extent to which we're invested in them comes out of our desire to practice interconnection, which I think, as you say, is another one of those things that we know, we know we're interconnected, we know how to be connected, and yet we continually forget in the face of the forced repetition, the enforced isolation that we are experiencing in capitalism. Yes, as you say, ungovernability, you know, and really thinking critically about I've been seeing the new commercials for the Apple Watch and they're like, it's even better. It knows when you're ovulating. It knows, you know, <laughs> it knows how many times you breathe when you were sleeping or whatever. And it's like, ah, you know, like well, that, there's something very creepy about that. What would it mean to refuse and be like, actually, I get there's convenience and there's all of these things about the knowability of an Apple watch that's connecting to my pulse in these deep ways. But <laughs> there's also my impulse to refuse it is not only because I don't necessarily want to be tracked or then, you know, they have things like, is that ovulation tracking going to be then used to try to prevent people's abortions and all of these types of things that are possible within that matrix. But also what if I want to continue to depend on myself to check in with what's going on with my body? What if I don't want to outsource that? What if outsourcing that actually decreases my connection with this multicellular, multi-organismal um, form that is my body? A wonderful, Alexis. One thing I have to say that what binds this book together for me and your other books is the love you put into it. It also just amazed me how you use that term love so many times in the book. You pepper it throughout. And every time I would read those sections, I would just immediately feel like somebody had just given me a big hug. You know, just be aware that your readers have probably felt that. And it really shines through both explicitly and implicitly the love that just flows through the book. And I think that's what in a way disrupts capitalism for me, you know, which is that love, which is not mediated purely through money and its movement. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Oh, you're so welcome. And I'm so glad you felt it that way. Because it's my daily practice, it has to be loving, right? Because I want to have a day where I can love myself. I want to have a day that's a loving day. And so I put that love in there because I need it to. So Alexis, we're coming to the end now. So I would like you to share before we wind up where you sort of go to next. What are the new show lines that beckon? What new depths are you going to explore? And any parting blessings or gifts for our listeners? Oh, thank you for that. I know. Well, I don't even know where <laughs> what the new depths are. I've been writing a lot about the sky, though. So I'll say that there's kind of like, what's the air teaching us? And what does it mean to be air, to be in air, to be circulating air all of the time? Some of that for me is guided by study of constellations and especially the study of constellations that Arawak and Carib ancestors have been doing for thousands of years. And yeah, so there's a depth, there's a height, there's all that connection. And I'm so happy, you know, I'm so happy to be with your listeners. Obviously, I am a listener and, and I love the explorations around what writing can do, what writing can be, where it can take us that you explore on this podcast. And so all the people who are interested in that, I'm like, yes, you know, you are my people. I'm really excited to be part of this archive that you're creating of that exploration. And I just want to say thank you to everyone 
You know, we definitely want to make sure that lots of Indians are reading Undrowned in the next couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> that will make me so happy. The river dolphins and the Ganges are all, you know, like there will be local relevance. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. A one, a one woman mission. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate that so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for joining Alexis. It's really an honor and a pleasure for me and I'm really looking forward to now spending some time with your older books and really looking forward to what you bring out next. Oh, thank you so much. It's been such an honor to be here. Thank you for everything that you do. Thanks to Alexis Pauline Gubbs for sharing her thoughts with us. The Subverse is the podcast of Dark and Light, a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagines futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice and culture. You can follow us on Instagram at Dark and Light Zine. If you like the show, please tell a friend and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. The Subverse is produced for us by Waka Media. On a programming note, we will be taking a bit longer with the production of our next episode. So please stay tuned on social media for its release date. So long and thanks for listening.